Good morning, Point Church. How are we doing this morning? Come on in, find a seat, stand to your feet. We teach you guys a new song this morning. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. The end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages. Step down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Sing hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living
morning. We serve a God who is alive. Amen. What a powerful song. You guys continue to sing with us this morning.
guys may be seated. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that our God does not have a tiny house. There's room for everybody in his house, and that is an awesome thing. Uh, I want to welcome you guys to our service here this morning at the Point Church. If you are streaming live right now online, you are also a part of the service this morning. So thank you guys for streaming in and being a part of this. Um, today, we are in the second week of our series, Transform. Um, now, if you are here for the first time, you're our guest. As you came in, hopefully you received a, a little uh, worship guide. That's what we call it. Um, some churches, they call it a bulletin here at the Point Church. We call it a worship guide. So I want to kind of point you to that worship guide really quickly. Um, if you open it up, there's a little card in there. You can rip that card out. We'd love for you guys to fill that card out if you're first, second, or third time guest with us today. And at the end of the service, hold on to that card. At the end of the service, walk it back out into the lobby, and you'll see a desk there with a big green sign, a banner that says, Welcome. If you can take that card over to our team that's going to be serving there this morning, uh, we have a gift just to say thank you for coming, being a part of this service, and hanging out with us today. Uh, we'd love to, to get your information, not to, you know, chase you down or anything. We just want you to know about our church and what our church is all about, um, not just inside of these walls, but outside the walls in our community. Um, so that's all first, second, and third time guests. Uh, there's one other thing I want to point you to um, before we move on to our next thing, and this is our app. We have a church app, and you're going to hear me say this a couple times, so just go ahead and get ready for it. Uh, we have a church app. If you look it up in the app store, you can go to the Point Church, and, and you can find it there. But if you open up your app on the home page, if you scroll down a little, you'll see a little button that says Impact. And, uh, and I'd, I'd love for you, if you've got your phone and the app, go ahead and go there, because we're going we're gonna to talk about something that in just a moment. But uh, if I could have our first impressions team come forward. This is also the part of the service where we get to give together. Um, and, and I say we get to give. See, there's a couple reasons here at the Point Church why we give. Now, if you guys, first impression team, you guys just hold just for a second before you pass them. Hold on one second just before you pass them. Okay. Sorry. Thanks. Um, I know. Now they're going to be standing there. They're going to be in like, what do we do next? What do we do next? Um, so there's a couple reasons why we give here at the Point Church. One is God commands us to, but he also, he says, test me in this. And that's a big thing, you know, to, to say, okay, well, this is, this is what I've worked for. Uh, this, this is my earned money, right? And, and you're asking me to give back. And he says, you know what? Test me. Trust me in this. So that's a big reason why we give here at the Point Church. The other reason is it makes a difference and an impact on not just those around us in this room, but outside the room. But it may have changed the life of someone that's beside you, behind you, in front of you. It makes a difference. So the First Impressions team, you guys can go ahead and, and pass the baskets. Um, and there are a couple different ways you can give. There's an envelope in between your seat. Uh, you can go online and you can give at thepoint.cc slash give. You can also text the give. We have multiple different ways you can do that. You can also do that on the app. There's a button down at the bottom that says give. Um, and you can set those digital formats up to do a one-time gift or they can be reoccurring. Uh, that's something that we do at our house. Sometimes it's weird because I never have that experience of like putting something in in the basket. Um, but that's just something that our family does. And um, it's just automatically done every, every time we get paid. Now something else that I want to share with you guys is I asked you to pull up that app a minute ago. If you guys have that app up, if you click on the impact button on that home page, there are so many different things that we do in this community. And, and you guys oftentimes will ask us, hey, what's coming up next? What can we do? What can our small group do? We want to help. We want to get involved. Well, this is an easy way for you guys to totally bypass us if you'd like to. You can go onto the app, click the button, and there's right now four different opportunities and ministries that you can partner with and just jump right into it. And, and you hit the button, it gives you all the details and information that you need. Uh, but we want to continue partnering with you guys and making a difference, not just in this church, but in our community. I'd like you guys to join me now as we pray together and ask God to bless what's been given today. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this beautiful morning that you've given us. And Father, we, we sang this song a minute ago, but truly to, to understand that you've got a house, you've got a home, you've got a place 
that you're preparing and you've got ready for each and every one of us. And, and, and there's not going to be a day where we, we come and you say, you know what, the, the, the house is full. Sorry, there's no more room. There's no more space. That's not going to happen. Because in your house, there are so many rooms. We just say thank you for that, God. We take a moment this morning, we say thank you. And we ask, Father, that you would bless the money, the gifts, the offering, the sacrifices that have been made here this morning, Father, that that you would do great things with those gifts within these walls and outside of these walls. That your name would be known and that your kingdom would grow. We thank you and we ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. You guys go ahead and stand as we continue to worship this morning.
Let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. You are stronger, you are stronger. Sin is broken and you have saved me. It is written, Christ is risen, Jesus, you are Lord of all. Hey. Let's pray together. Father God, we have just sung and declared that Jesus is Lord Lord of all. And because of that, we lift his name higher. Not just in song, but, but as we live our everyday lives. And why do we do that? Because he rose from the dead. He is, he is resurrected. And because of his resurrection, we have a new life. We get to be transformed because of your power. And so we lift up the name of Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. You guys can have a seat. So as you heard Pastor Justin say, you've called us in week two of Transformed, and, and uh, we are excited about this series and, and excited about how God is working and moving uh, to bring about transformation uh, in our lives. So uh, this is 50 days of transformation, so there's many more. If, you, if you're not a believer, thank you for being here. Uh, we're, we're glad that you're here. We hope this is a safe place for you as you're trying to figure out who Jesus is and understand him. You, this is a great series for you to come because you, you'll get to see and understand why, why we do some of the things we do, why we're driven the way we are, some of the things that we, quite frankly, struggle with, to be honest with you, as we, as we walk with our relationship with Jesus and as we're developing that along the way. And so, so we're glad that you're here. This is going to be a great opportunity for us to understand transformation. And so last week, Pastor Ray teed it up, set it up in the, in the concept that we're transforming our spiritual lives. And so there were about 500 of us who, who tried and attempted to journal last week. Uh, and as we began that process, some of us were a little more uh, successful than others. All of us were successful because we, we tried to start and we began that process. And, but all of us, and you can participate without having a journal. Uh, that's, there's a section there on the app for you to be able to do this. All of us had this opportunity to begin to try to memorize uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Are you with me? Everybody looking like, what is he talking about? So 2 Corinthians, read it with me. Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. Old life is gone. A new life has begun. That's right. And so that was last week's memorization. We worked on that. And why has that happened? We just sang about it because the old life is gone and the new life has come. The minute that we cross the line of faith, if you haven't crossed the line of faith, you haven't experienced this. This hasn't had the opportunity, but we believe that Jesus died and he rose again. He's, he resurrected and he's alive. We believe that. And because of that, we get this brand new life. The old life is gone and the new life has begun. Brand new life being transformed by Jesus. You see, we talked about the Spirit, day three, for those of you who journal. If you at least got to day three, you got to where we talked about the Holy Spirit working in our lives to bring about this transformation. You see, today, I want to let you know that as a believer, we have a different worldview than you do as an unbeliever. I just want to say that. Now, I'm not making any judgment. I'm just stating a fact. 
And as a Christian, our worldview begins with this particular verse that we just read. Because of the way we look at Jesus. Because of, of His Spirit working in us, transforming us. Matter of fact, in the book of Ephesians, in chapter 1, it says that, that the prayer that, that this guy who wrote to the church in this town called Ephesus, thus the book of Ephesians, he's writing, he's, he says, I'm praying for you that you may know, that you may know the power that God used to resurrect Jesus. That's Irvin's paraphrase, but that's what that verse is saying. That you can know this incomparably great power for us who believe. It's the same power that he used to bring Jesus to life. We have that power. We have the ability to be transformed. And it's not by us. It's not by our strength, our might, our intellectual ability, the intestinal fortitude that we may have. It's not by those things, but it's by the power of Jesus working in us. And so here's where we begin today, talking about physical transformation. So if you're taking notes in the app, you have your journals, or if you're using the insert in the worship guide, Physical transformation begins when I practice spiritual habits that reduce stress in my life. Hmm. Have you ever thought about that? That stress actually impacts my physical life? I did a little research, okay? So as I, was, as I was looking through this, I began to research. I don't believe everything I see on the Internet. Everything on the Internet is not true. So I'm going to go do a little research to make sure that what I'm reading is true. So I did a little research and, and to see if this is true. So I, so I found, believe it, of all places on Huffington Post, I found this great article, and it said that 70 to 90% of all doctor visits are as a direct result of stress in our lives. Well, okay, that's Huffington Post. Really? You know, I mean, that's like, uh, this, I don't know. That, Huffington Post, really? All right, so I did a little bit more research, and I found WebMD, a legitimate site, in my opinion. And guess what I find out on WebMD? 70 to 90% of all Doctor visits are a direct correlation to stress. Whoa. Does that mean if I, if I reduce the amount of stress in my life that I can go to the doctor less? Well, I don't know, but that seems to make the implication. Maybe so. I did a little bit more research. And I found this great article on NPR. Matter of fact, if you want to see the, uh, if you go into the app and if you look down on the sermon and look under notes, sermon notes uh, today, you'll see the, uh, the actual link to both these articles there, there in the app. NPR, chronic stress is hazardous to health and can lead to early death from heart disease, cancer, and other health problems. But it turns out it doesn't matter whether the stress comes from major events in life or from minor problems. Both can be deadly. Matter of fact, it's how you react to the smaller everyday stress that impacts your life. Wow. Wow. I mean, we all have smaller everyday stress. I mean, it's just that just kind of goes with, with the world, right? I mean, it's, it's there. And the question is, not so much the reduction of the stresses, but how we deal with it. And so NPR, being NPR, says, hey, we got four great ways for you to deal with stress. Here's our recommendation. Number one, 30 minutes a day of moderate aerobic activity. Number two, daily meditation. Number three, controlled breathing. And number four, don't do overdo alcohol. It actually disrupts your sleep. And that's their recommendation. So what do we do? We're done. We go home now. We got it, right? We're all fixed, right? 
we just do those four things, we can go home, right? Early, it's 11.30, man. No. Because you see, again, we as believers, those of us in, in, who are in this room or if you're online, those of us who have crossed the line of faith, we have a distinctly different view of our world. Distinctly different. Because, if, because from a pre-believer, we had a humanistic view of the world. In, the, in that we are, had the ability to do things our way and, and our end was within ourselves and we were our own God and we had the ability to do certain things and all things and, and we had that because it was all about us, that humanistic perspective. But the minute that we cross the line of faith, we grab a worldview that is of Christ. And it is of His power. That's why that 2 Corinthians 5.17 is so huge. Because if anyone is in Christ, they are new, new, the new life. The old life is gone. That's the humanistic viewpoint of the world. And the new life has come, and that's the viewpoint of Christ and God, God working in me. See, it's not about me doing it myself. Now, I have to partner along with the process, but I recognize that it is God's if I can say it this way, resurrecting power working in me to be able to live the kind of life that he wants me to live. And thus helps me to deal with stress. And so last week, we took a look at what's probably the most, most uh, well-known parable, the parable of the prodigal son. This week, we're going to take a look at, at as probably the most well-known psalm the 23rd Psalm, and as we do, we're going to learn seven habits that will transform our spiritual lives. 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So as we take a look at this passage from a slightly different angle this morning, it's my hope and prayer that all of us, all of us will find new habits that will allow us to deal with stress in a better way. Now let me give a disclaimer. I gave a disclaimer in the first service. I'm going to give a disclaimer right here. Listen, I struggle with stress. And I'll be honest with you, it gets the best of me sometimes. And so here's the deal. This was probably more for me than for you. So I invite you in this conversation I'm kind of having with me, I invite you to come into the conversation and be a part of it. And to see if we can develop these seven habits. Habit number one. Look to God to meet all my needs. Now, now Pastor Ray, uh, our, our, our lead teaching pastor, he, he kind of turn, he turns a phrase differently than I do, better than I do, well, however you want to say it. I mean, he can wordsmith. He talks a little faster, too. And so... So with that, you know, he's got this really cool phrase that he says, all means all, and he kind of goes through that. Yeah, so y'all know it better than I do. Well, so here's the deal. All is, is all. I mean, it's, it's everything. It's just everything. All is everything. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack 
nothing. Matter of fact, there's another tra translation that says, I shall not want. So if I buy into this concept that Jesus is, is my Savior, he becomes my shepherd. Now, now here, you need to know something. I don't know too many, anybody sheep herders out here? Got any sheep herders? No? No, no, she's seen. Yeah, we're all, I had to do a little research on that. You know, they actually say sheep just aren't the smartest of animals. And, and they need some guidance. And they need some help, and so there's a shepherd that gives them that guidance. He usually has a couple of dogs working with them to make sure all that that takes place. And the shepherd's got things to protect the sheep, and he does things for the sheep, and he feeds them at the right time and makes sure they have opportunity to graze. And we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. But sheep aren't very smart, okay? Just saying that. The Lord is my shepherd. I'm not very smart. <laughs> there you go. You know somebody's tracking with me. Yeah, there you go. But if the Lord is my shepherd, guess what? I don't want anything. I mean, all is all, right? I lack nothing. I don't want anything. I mean, what's anything? I mean, you name it. You put it in your brain. What are you looking for? What is, a, what is the number one thing you're looking for in life right now? I want that. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Oh, that hurt. You see, when we build the habit to look to God to meet all our needs, the habit will reduce the stress of worry. Worry. we build the habit second habit I need to obey God's instructions about rest don't you think it's interesting that if you read in Genesis that the God who created the universe created the universe and at the end, on the, six, on the seventh day, as the Bible says it, at the end of that process, he rested. I mean, he took a day off. The guy checked out. I mean, he took a day off. I mean, think about it. How many times do you read in the New Testament where Jesus is doing all this stuff, and he's going here, he's healing these people, and then boom, he checks out. Man, the leaves are looking really good. Let's go check them out. And he, boom, he was gone through the mountains. Or he says, you know, I need to see that painted desert. Boom, he went out to the desert. I mean, he checked out. Why? Good question. You know, when God created us, if, if he wanted us to go 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I think he would have created that within us. Just a thought. Look at verse 2. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. I think this is really interesting verbiage here. He makes me. Now, i got to be real careful. My daughter's here this morning. I said something about my kids this morning. But when they were much younger, my, da my daughter's 22, my son's 25. When they were much younger and it was nap time, I'm just going to say that was kind of a hard time. Bedtime wasn't the easiest thing in the world. Not always. Sometimes it was, but not always. And I don't know why. I mean, I, mean, I really don't know why. Because, you know, as a parent, I know best at that moment for my kids. I mean, I know what my kids need. And I know good and well that if my kids didn't get the sleep they needed, they were going to be a hornet that had been messed with. <laughs> to say it kindly. It wasn't going to be pretty. I knew they needed rest. I knew there were some things that they needed. And rest was one of them. And so Don and I worked it to making sure they got the rest that they needed. Don't you think it's interesting in this passage right here? He's got his sheep. Remember what I said about sheep? Not very smart. He makes them to lay down. <laughs> interesting. We need some rest. We need some rest. 
Obey God's instruction about rest. If you read in the scripture, you're going to see God says get some rest multiple times. Matter of fact, it's one of the big ten. This habit will reduce the stress of hurry. Matter of fact, a better word might be busyness. But we got to get some rest. Third habit. Recharge my soul with beauty. Now, I know that's not a real man word. Okay? I get that. I get that. Beauty. I mean, we don't look at something and go, oh, that's so beautiful. Okay? I know that's not a real man word. But we need a little beauty in our life. Okay, so first of all, we just read, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He doesn't make me lie down in a muddy pasture. He doesn't make me lie down in a, a rocky pasture. He doesn't make me lie down in a thorny pasture. He makes me to lie down in a green pasture. Verse 2, he leads me beside quiet water. He refreshes my soul. Wow, now I don't know about you, but it certainly don't feel like fall outside. It's hot. And on a hot day, when you're outside working, I mean, you really need some nice, cool water. Makes you feel good. Refreshes you. Rehydrates you. We need to look at God's beauty. There's a lot of people in this world that will go, you know, I don't have to go to church. I can go up to the mountains and I can see God and I can worship God. Or I can go out to the river and I can, I can see God. I can go down to the lake and I can see God and I can worship God and be part of God's creation. I can go out on the golf course and worship God and be part of there. I can be up in a, a deer stand somewhere and I can worship God there. And I'm going to look at you and go, you are absolutely correct. You are. Spot on. Because it's God's creation. You're going to see God. And you're going to worship Him. Now, I don't have enough time to go in this whole concept of why we need to meet together and hang out together and, and be together and, and, and do all that. Don't have time to go there. But I'm just going to tell you, you can do those things. We still need to meet together. We still need to hang out with other believers. That's important. But we need God's beauty. Why? Because there's something about that that restores us and refreshes us. You see, when we recharge our soul with beauty, it reduces the stress of the ugliness of life. See, there's some of us that need to turn the TV off, turn our phone off, turn our computer off. Because there's some ugly stuff out there. And I'm not talking about pornography. All right? There's just some ugly stuff out there. We need to unplug from that. Sometimes life gets really ugly, stressful at work. It gets real stressful at work sometimes. I got deadlines to meet. I got people I can't make happy. I got things to do that's impossible to do. And I mean, you know it. It's ugly. I need, I need some rest. I need, to, I need to put some margin in my life. Get in the habit of putting margin in my life where I can see God's beauty and restore myself. You know, if the first thing you do in the morning is, is open up your phone and look at news, or if you turn on your television and, or you, you open up your app and some prime and you're watching whatever, where's the beauty of God? We've got to create some margin. Recharge my soul with beauty. All right, fourth habit. Go to God for guidance. Go to God for guidance. He, by the way, He guides me. By the way, He, He leads me. By the way, He, He restores my soul. By the way, He, He's my shepherd. He's the one that takes care of me. You notice who's it all, who it's all about? It's all about him. It's not about me. Go to God for guidance. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. How do you know what a right path is? How do you know if your life is right? How do you know if the way you're thinking is right? How do you know that? Well, he guides me because I just feel it. I got a feeling. 
Mm, I got a feeling. And so it must be right if I feel it. If it feels right, I do it. Mm. We need to go to God. How do we go to God? Part of that's getting in His Word. Part of that is looking at His Word. Part of that's being around other believers, but He's still looking at His Word. You know, we need to listen to the Holy Spirit in our lives. Absolutely. But just because it feels right doesn't make it right. No matter what it is. You see, see this reduces the stress of complexity. Oh, we live in a complex world. It is more complex now than it ever has been. We live in a pluralistic society. We live in a, in a, a post-Judean Christian society. And I'm not saying that's bad within itself. I'm just saying that's what it is. Because, listen, there are Christians who are flourishing under communism. It doesn't matter whatever political system it is. Or it doesn't matter what government religion may or may not be there. It doesn't matter. But we need guidance. We need guidance. God's guidance because we live in a complex world. We can't trust ourselves. We go to God for guidance. All right, fifth habit. Trust God in the dark valleys. You know, all these others are kind of hard. This one's really hard. I mean, what do we do? God, why'd you give me cancer? God, why'd you kill that person? Why'd you take that person out of my life? God, why, why you let that evil take place? God, why, why did you make me lose my job? God, how come my mom and daddy are terrible? God, how come that person looks at me and, and because of the color of my skin or because of, of what I think and what I look like? Why, why do they bring that oppression on me? And we immediately look to God. Immediately. Why'd you do that, God? We're in a dark valley. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Sometimes suffering is suffering. Just because we're believers doesn't mean that we're going to not suffer. Last time I checked, the Apostle Paul who wrote 12 or 13 books in the New Testament, the guy who wrote these letters, he was beheaded and was imprisoned. Last time I checked, Peter, one of the disciples, one of those guys who followed Jesus, who was intimate with Jesus in the sense that he was in the inner three circle, he knew Jesus probably better than anybody else. Him and James and John, he was hung upside down on a cross. Last time I checked, the guy that we decided to follow, Jesus, they falsely accused him, scourged him with a whip to the point of death, and then they hung him on the cross. That's who we're following. Now, he rose. <laughs> yeah. We're going to suffer. We're going to go through dark valleys. And dark valleys are losses. And they come at any time. That's the stress of loss. Loss of job. Loss of money. Loss of you took something away from me by saying something about me. You demean me. Loss of, loss of, of, of anything. Anytime we go through a loss, there's an element that we trust God in that lostness. Because he's there. Your rod and your staff, they come to me. Look, it says, you're with me. Doesn't mean you're, you're going to take it away, but you're with me right there. As I'm struggling, you're with me. You're going to protect me. You're going to take care of me. Number six. Sixth habit. Man, these are a bunch of habits right here. Whew. Number six, let God be my defender. Let God be my defender. I love this one. 
This one kind of challenged me just a little bit. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. All right, so get this image. This is like David's writing this psalm, and, and so he's thinking about his enemies who he's fighting with, who want to kill him, who want to take his life. These people are just against him. They, they, so much so, they, they want to do everything they can to destroy him. Okay, that's those people. And he's saying, here's what God does. God prepares this nice banquet table in front of my enemy. Man, I mean, this is, a, this is a place to rest and relax. This is like, I get to eat in great comfort. I, get to, I don't have to eat on the run. I don't have to eat like I'm sneaking away. I get to eat in great comfort. And God prepared this table before me. And he, he went on to say, he anointed me. A great sign of blessing. I'm in front of my enemy. He anoints me right in front of my enemy. My cup overflows. What does that mean? I mean, David was letting him be his defender. Let God be his defender. Now, what does this do? This helps us beat the stress of challenges. And we are challenged every day of our lives. Yeah, you know what I'm about to say, don't you? You, you, you know that one word that's really supposed to be two words, but it's one word that comes out there. You know what I'm about to say? Mm-hmm, Facebook. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can say whatever I want to say. I get to hide behind all that. Mm, let God be your defender. Let God be your defender. We got to leave room for God's judgment. And I'm not saying I'm praying that, that God destroys you. I wouldn't do that. But leave, leave room for God's judgment. And there's, a, there's a passage in the New Testament. We shouldn't be afraid of the person that can take our life. We should be the, afraid of the person that can dim, condemn us to an eternal separation in hell. We should let God defend us. It makes our testimony so much stronger. Because why? Because we're experiencing the, the, the resurrecting power that Jesus gives us. We're challenged every day. We need to let God be our defender, develop that habit. All right, habit number seven. Expect God to finish what he starts in me. Expect God to finish what he starts in me. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There's a passage in the New Testament. Again, this is for those of us who have crossed the line of faith. It says that he who began a good work in you will complete it on the day of Christ Jesus. What does that mean? That means that, that, that you... And I, we accepted Jesus and what he did for us on a cross. We accepted that at his invitation. We chose that, but it was only at his invitation. He prompted that. He began that work. Listen, if you're, if you're not a believer and you're here this morning, I'm just going to tell you, you're in this room, you're online, I'm just going to tell you straight up, you are in this room, you are watching us online, because God prompted you. He prompted you to be here. He prompted you. Because He desperately wants a relationship with you. He who began a good work in you will complete it on the day of Christ Jesus. What does that mean? This habit, when we get this habit of expecting God to finish what He starts in us, that was going to help me beat the stress of the future because I am so worried about the future. Every one of us in here, in this room, think about tomorrow. Some of us fear tomorrow. Some of us fear a couple of months down the road. Some of us fear 10 years down the road. Trusting God with the future. See, each one of these habits train us to trust God. 
Now, we sang a song earlier called Stronger. Matter of fact, all of our songs today in, in this whole message, everything ties together. Because he is stronger. Because he rose from the dead, he is stronger. And because he is stronger, I can be all that God wants me to be. And I can develop these habits, but I've got to reach up to God and I've got to grab hold of God because it's not about me, it's about God. And see, too often we don't do that. God's there in the waiting. He's waiting for us to grab hold of Him and say, I need you. And He's waiting. And He's waiting. And He's waiting. And so it's my hope and prayer that as we sing today that we will stop being our own and that we will reach up and we will grab God's hand and we will allow Him to work in our lives to develop habits that will reduce the stress in our lives. Yeah. 
So, what's the so what about today? We sang some good songs. We looked at the scripture. I'm not saying teaching was good. I'm just saying the scripture was good. Okay? So what? So what? Then what, what's the whole purpose of today? What's the so what? I'm fed up with being stressed out in my life. You see, we're sheep. I'm sorry. We're sheep. And we got to get to that fed up point most of the time. It's got to be so bad that it literally breaks our back before we'll do anything about it. So I'm asking you today, are you fed up? With stress. It's taking the joy that God has for you. So what? But what now? What now? Starting today, I choose God and His help. I choose God and His help. And I will develop these seven habits in my life. Now, here's why I'm asking you to write this down. And I want you to show it to somebody. I want you to go to somebody, hey, I put my name on that. I'm making this choice that I'm going to choose God. Even as a believer, I'm going to choose God and His help. I'm going to put it down, and I want to show my best friend. Don't show it to your neighbor. I don't know if they know you or not. Show it to somebody who cares. Show it to somebody that, that, that sees how you live and walks to where you walk. And say, hey, I'm choosing today, and I'm going to develop these. See, that's goals and habits. That's why we write those things down, because, because it holds us to our challenge. Why? Because I'm going to write those goals down. down. I'm going to write these things down. I'm going to grab hold of God, and by His power, these things are going to happen. How am I going to do that? I just said that. I'm going to talk to my friends about making plans and goals to implement these habits. I'm going to talk to my friends. I'm going to talk to somebody. I'm putting this in my life. To what ends? That I would be transformed in my physical life. Because I want to honor God with my body. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 20. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we were bought, those of us who believe in you were bought by the blood of Jesus. And we belong to soul. We is our body. We is our mind. So God, help us as we reach out to you to let you transform us, to let you empower us to develop habits, spiritual habits that will change our body. Jesus, we pray. Amen.